I am exploring for myself uh, a uh, appropriate camera to get that would essentially allow me to leave the Canon M6 Mark II on my desktop as the main streaming camera. So whenever it comes to recording things like, you know, documenting my journey in jujitsu, which I've been training at since 2018, um, uh, or, uh, you know, outings with the family and friends, all the non-professional stuff that I want to do, uh, what would be a good camera for me? And, and that's why I'm looking for, uh, that's why I'm renting these different cameras. And I have a list of cameras that I wanted to rent and try before I even make a decision, right? I rented the R8, I'm renting the R6 Mark II. Later, I'm gonna see if I can rent the Sony uh, ZV-E1, which is essentially the same A7S 3 FX3 sensor, but in a ZV uh, E10 or A7C type body. I've, I've uh, had the A7C for, uh, for a little while before. I borrowed my friend's Canon R10. So I had the opportunity to try out these cameras cameras to see which one would be a good everyday carry type of gear. So having said all that, let's go through your comment, see if I can help you with this. Okay. So, so you have a Sony ZV-E10 right now. Good. You have a Sigma 16 millimeter F1.4. That's a great lens. Um, a Sigma 56 1.4. That's also a great lens. In fact, if you had two Sony ZV-E10 or two Sony APS-C cameras, you could have one 16 mil and one 56 mil as a B cam, and you can do a very good quality multi-camera shoot if you wanted to with uh, these two cameras, these two lenses alone. Uh, you have a 70 to 350 G OSS. I believe that is a staple lens that I think everybody should have in their kit. In fact, I've rented one right here. This is a Canon uh, 70 to 300 millimeter ISL lens, which I've adapted to the Sony ZV-E10. So you've got like some really good lenses and I feel my camera is doing all of it. I mean, the full HD and Sony A6000 series and ZV-E10 is poor. Yeah, it is. And in fact, one of the things that I would advise and recommend is that uh, if you, if your system, your editing system can handle it, then I would say continue to shoot in 4k and, uh, deliver in 1080 if that's what you're seeking to do. Um, uh, getting good 1080p natively is going to be challenging with the gear that you have. Uh, and a lot of the new gears also, that's, that is the reality. In fact, I feel like the 1080 that's really good in the Sony is actually the SNQ mode. So if you do something like 120 frames per second on the Sony ZV-E10, that 1080 looks great in my opinion. It looks way better than the 1080p that you get at 24p or 30p. So yeah. So uh, the sh so I really like I really hate the rolling shutter and the quality. Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I'm with you on this one. Uh, there, there are a couple of things that you can do to mitigate the rolling shutter, but like um, a lot of that is in the post editing process. So uh, part of that would, uh, would require that you use something like Catalyst Browse. Right. So if you run the system through Catalyst Browse, it'll crop into your picture a little bit and it will straighten out the rolling shutter a little bit. Um, Sony zv Den is also capturing a lot of the gyroscopic data internally. So you can, instead of gyro flow, I mean, instead of Catalyst Browse, you can use gyro flow. I have found gyro flow is significantly better in terms of system performance and the speed in which it can process these images, uh, way better than Catalyst Browse. I love gyro flow for that reason, but Catalyst Browser, Catalyst Browse is easier to use. Um, one of the things about gyro flow is that you can set the, uh, there, there's a feature built in there that would enable you to correct the rolling shutter. It's not perfect. It doesn't eliminate it completely, but it does make a significant difference in so depending on like if you're doing a lot of running around type of stuff then the rolling shutter is improved significantly it doesn't look now so what it is is like so for example on the canon right the canon m6 mark ii uh i will get rolling shutter performance natively which is about 17 uh, milliseconds, right? So 17 milliseconds compared to Sony ZV-E10, which is something along the lines of like 28 milliseconds, right? Almost, uh, almost double, right? Uh, now 17 milliseconds, when you correct it, it is almost similar to like less than half of that. 
Whereas on the ZVE 10, when you correct it, it's half of whatever that is. So 26 or 28 milli, uh, milliseconds ends up looking like 16 or 17 milliseconds, which is not bad. It's, it might be a little bit noticeable, but it's not as noticeable as it in, ter- in the sense of it being distracting. I hope that makes sense. So yeah, there's ways to mitigate the uh, the rolling shutter, and well, among the things that also mitigates is, is um, stabilized lenses, um, gimbals, tripods, things like that. So, uh, but I also understand that it's not the best camera to run around with. It's not the best camera to shoot active stabilization at the telephoto end, fully stretched out in a moving vehicle, because then everything is going to be jello. Uh, so yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a it's a limitation, and that limitation requires you to make some de- decisions before you shoot. So um, yeah, so yeah, the rolling shutter is poor, um, and the quality uh, is not as good as full frame. Now this is something that I don't understand, right? So what do you, what do you mean that the quality is not good as full frame? Um, I guess in the sense of the Canon R8, uh, in, in the fact that. Yes, in the Canon R8, you get 4K 60 frames per second. You don't have that option on the uh, ZV-E10, but you have SNQ mode. In SNQ mode, the image quality that comes out on that in 1080p mode at 60 frames or 120 frames per second, I think looks great, uh, especially if you're going to be watching that content on your phone or um, even on your TV, it looks fine. So, and I've shot a lot of footage at 1080p, uh, not 1080p, but SNQ mode in 120p at you know 1080. And to me, it's like, you know, I feel like it looks as good, if not better than the 4K. And that's probably because of the rolling shutter performance in slow motion is significantly more improved um, in that mode. Also, if you shoot in 1080p, the rolling shutter in general is also a lot uh, better performing because it's not taking the entire 6K image and downsampling it. It's literally picking like every other picture or landscaping, whatever the whole methodology, algorithmic me- methodology of processing the image is. So uh, now I like to improve to 4K 60 in the same level at least. So when the R8 was announced, I was excited as was I. I was very excited when the R8 was announced. In fact, I thought the R8 was going to be like the M6 Mark II without any of its uh, limitations. Uh, in fact, I thought the same for the R10. Uh, I had the R10 for a month. I was borrowing it from a friend of mine. Rather, my friend was going overseas and he loaned it to me to test out and work out all the kinks. And um, it essentially was everything that the M6 Mark II could do, but better. Um, only thing that I didn't like about the R10 was the fact that the um the viewfinder <laughs> it's just annoying i don't like the viewfinder and so i i i almost feel like i'm ref- i'm refusing to pay extra money for a piece of hardware and feature that i absolutely have no use for but again that's just me personally um but r10 is a great camera r7 also seems like a very good video camera um, so something to definitely keep in mind. Um, so the R8 was announced and I was excited because except for the battery, it looked like a dream to have a baby R6 Mark II for just $1,500. So I decided to switch from Sony to Canon again, because I've had the RP and 7, 24 to 105. Okay. Uh, for a month in 2020 and I liked it, but now I see a lot of people with different kinds of issues with the R8. I suppose Canon can fix that. Now here's the thing. When you buy a camera, uh, even though both companies, uh, Canon and Panasonic, are known to support their gear and improve the performance of their hardware over time, I will I would still not buy the gear for what it can become because you don't know whether or not that's going to be a reality and if that happens. So uh, suppose maybe Canon will fix it or maybe they won't. We don't know. Uh, and so eventually with new firmware, but I saw your video, I'm thinking maybe, uh, if I'm taking the right choice to sell all my Sony gear. So I guess the question for you is for somebody like yourself, um, like you've got Sony gear and you want to switch to Canon. I mean, if I was in your position and I already have some quality glass, right. And like you mentioned before, you've got the Sigma 16, Sigma 56, 
and Sony 70-30. So two are APS-C lenses, one's a full frame lens to my knowledge. Then you have a Viltrox 23 1.4, that's an amazing lens. And the 16 to 50 and 55 to 210 kit lenses, plus flash, triggers, and batteries too. Like you've already got the whole set. Uh, so for switch to Canon, if I buy all my stuff, uh, I could uh, could have the Canon R8 with two batteries and just two lenses. But that's the thing, man. Like if like if you stay within the Sony ecosystem, like you already got all the glass. It's just a matter of the body itself that you're dealing with right now is not necessarily the best body. I guess my question for you right now is that are you in a situation where the gear that you have is keeping you from being able to make your clients happy as i'm assuming like these things that you're doing uh some of it puts money in your pocket right you got to look at it from that perspective right is it a is it a tool that helps generate income and so if it is and your clients are happy and this is more or less something that will make your life easier not necessarily make your clients happier then i would say be patient whereas on the other hand if it's something that you're doing for your clients, but like they want more, they're just not satisfied with the quality of the work that you're putting out. But it's one of those things where they see improvement over time, but you know your improvement is going to come with the appropriate gear that you have. Then that's a different story. But that's not a question that I can answer. That's a question that you can answer. I know for me, uh, I have enough ability uh, with relation to the gear that even if I have gear that's poor, I can put out a quality product that my client is satisfied with. And so for that reason, I don't like, I'm not buying all the newest gear. Like I got like the stuff that I do buy that's, ex well, then I'm not, the stuff that I have that's expensive, I'm renting for the most part, only to try it out and see if it's actually gonna help me in my workflow or essentially give me joy <laughs> in being able to use it. And so like everything I've got is literally used. The only thing that I bought new was uh well the canon m6 mark ii i bought used i mean not used i bought it new um the zve 10 i think of the three that i have two of them or one of them i bought new and the other two i bought used or refurbished and so i uh, saw so that i can get the best deal possible so uh, but in each of these purchases it was so that i can be able to produce more and satisfy my clientele and the work that I do and increase my output so that generates helps me generate more money. Uh, even with the folks that I work with on another project where I helped, uh, help their YouTube channel grow to over 100,000 subscribers, just, just to kind of let you know, these are two YouTube silver play buttons for two different projects, clients that I worked on. So uh, with relation to the work that I'm doing, like at the end of the day, uh, I produce a lot of content, I produce a lot of videos, even with the clients that I'm working with, the, the content that I'm have or, or, or the, the channels or the gear that I'm having them get so that they can continue to produce stuff without me. So the work can continue and whatnot. It's usually centered around their ability to produce stuff. So in all video cases, it's almost, I almost always default down to Sony and Sony has been super reliable for video. So in your case, you're talking about like you've got a really decent setup. Now, I understand how you're talking about with relation to like, like you've got some good glass and you want to, and you're considering selling all of that glass. And this is where a lot of that quality is with the video that comes in. It's in, it's, it's not the body itself, but what you put in front of it. And at the same time, what meaning the glass, what is that glass pointing at? Right. That's what it really comes down to. So. I mean, you, you've got the gear, so like, I don't know if it's worth switching to Canon for that reason. Now, some of the stuff that you mentioned, right? So the Canon R8 with two batteries and just two lenses. Um, like, I mean, if that fulfills your needs, that's good. And, and, and I know in my case of shooting, like I like to shoot with multiple lenses, meaning like I'll have two bodies and one body will have one lens and another body will have the other lens. So like pairings that I enjoy is like uh, a 24 or a 35 millimeter on one camera and then maybe like a 85 millimeter on another camera uh, or a 14 to 16 millimeter, 14 to 20 millimeter on one camera and a 30 or 40 millimeter on another camera. So, uh, but like, again, if, if I were to like, like I've built out a set 
of lenses. These are all Canon lenses, by the way, and almost all of these Canon lenses I use on my Sony bodies. Sorry. Um, and so, and I, I'm just thinking about, oh yeah. Um, and when it comes to autofocus, I've actually got Canon, uh, not Canon, but Sigma EF lenses. So, um, so this way I have cross compatibility, um, between, so this here is uh, Sigma uh, 30 mil, um, 1.4. Uh, I'm shooting on a Sigma 18 to 35. Um, I have a, a Sigma uh, 24 mil, 1 point, uh, 24 millimeter 1.4 art. Um, this is also a uh, great lens. And the thing about these Sigma lenses is that with the Sigma MC11 adapter, uh, it would work flawlessly uh, with my Sony bodies. Or if I get a MC21 adapter, it would work flawlessly with uh, the Lumix bodies. And by Lumix bodies, I'm talking specifically the newer ones, the uh, uh, the, the Lumix. Uh, and this is something that you may want to consider also. Have you considered Panasonic, right? The Lumix S5 Mark II. But if autofocus is not necessarily that much of a uh, necessity for you, uh, then maybe even any older bodies from Lumix would be worth considering. But like you've got the glass for Sony, so I would say stick with the Sony system, right? Um, I don't know if it would be worth it to uh, bump yourself to a Canon system. Um, if I if you buy also, you have the R8 with two batteries and just two lenses, a 24 to 105 and an 85 f2 macro. And so like just these two lenses, I guess it's a decent combo. But like, if you're talking just photography, yeah, I guess the 85 F2 is, sounds great. I have an 85 1.8 FD manual lens, uh, and it's a wonderful lens. It's a beautiful lens. Um, I essentially, I get tack sharp images at F2.8. Um, and if I need the extra light, I'll bump it up to 1.8 and I get a little bit of a dreamy look. Um, so, and maybe in a month, get a 16 millimeter of 2.8 and a 35 miller, millimeter 1.8 STM. I mean, one thought comes to mind is why, right? I have here, this is a Tokina uh, 16 millimeter, uh, six, 11 to 16 millimeter F uh, 2.8. And at the 16 millimeter field of view, this gives you uh, a full frame coverage. Um, so uh, I've used it on the A7C, it's been great. But then if you're talking about autofocus, um, there's a couple of lenses within the Sony system, such as the Tokina 11 to 18, the Tamron 11 to 20, um, that are also a couple of options to consider. Maybe even the Tamron 20 to 40 millimeter, which would be a great lens for you to consider within Sony that if you use it on a crop sensor, it's like a, it's like a, what, like a 30 to 60 mil. Um, and if you do get a full frame Sony body, then it works without any issues. Um, uh, but if you already have, uh, but you have a Sony ZV-10, yes, three of them. Um, and after, and I messed around with the Canon R8, yeah. So here's the thing, again, the context, right? I have the Sony ZV-E10, I am not trading those, I'm not changing those. Uh, those are dedicated video cameras that I use for work stuff, mainly producing talking head videos and occasionally stuff that requires long form content. Like recently, Jesse, just before responding to this video and recording this, I was outside shooting the moon and I was using two of my ZV-E10. One ZV-E10 right here, with the uh with the canon lens adapted to it um and the other zv10 to film me outside uh, i did not have to take this camera off of its uh desk mount and all the connections that are there so um again for the kind of recording that i was doing i'm sitting at a on a chair and recording the moon <laughs> right rolling shutter is not an issue in that setting so um but yeah like I think for 90% of all situations, the ZV-E10 is just fine. Now, one of the reasons why I am considering and looking at full frame is specifically for low light situations. Now, again, we're talking video. When it comes to photos, I don't see a low light as it being a problem, mainly because if I need more light, I can run that shutter down and put it on a tripod and I get slow shutter, 
I get ample light. And so like low light in photography for me has never been an issue. Uh, you talk about flashes, so you got flashes. So I don't know if a low light is still an issue in that, in that situation. But if we're talking about video, then yeah, low light becomes a challenge. And that's why I tend to avoid shooting in low light. And one of the perks of having a full frame is that I can run things up to ISO 12,800, 25,600, and it looks as good as an APS-C sensor when that thing is cranked up to like 6,400. And so, um, yeah, so this is, and if I'm at 6,400 on a full frame, then it looks great. So like, again, it's the context. What is the context and the setting in which you're looking for? Uh, and again, it's, uh, and I'm looking for like the R8 would have been good had it not been for the things that I mentioned. Uh, I think one of the real disappointments with it was the digital IS enhanced, which it gave me this whole wonky thing. Um, that, that to me, I think that by itself kind of became a deal breaker. Uh, add on top of that, the fact that, you know, the annoyance of the viewfinder, the, uh, uh, the lack of gyro data stabilization, um, the uh, essentially the, and, and that contributes to its size being not as portable and small enough. Like I love the size of the Sony uh, ZV E10. Uh, add on top of that a small rig cage and it's perfect with relation to how it fits in my hands. None of the none of the Canon bodies uh, are even close to that. The only other camera natively that feels as good as um, a ZV E10 with a cage on it is a GH5 and a GH4. But those cameras are relegated to being on sticks despite the fact that the GH5 has really good IMBIS. So, um, so you don't know what to do. All right. And yeah, look, changing systems is overwhelming. You decide overheating. Oh yeah. The overheating the thing is with the R8, it's, uh, it's a situation where it's like, I feel like the R8 overheating performance is better than the M6 Mark II. So that's why it doesn't really bother me as much, but it's something that is, is there. Um, the SD card connection issues, right. But that was still kind of solved through the, um, Canon utility app. But here's the thing, if you could get your hands on, well, you mentioned with the FX 30, uh, it for video, like for me, I think that would probably be a very good camera. I, I, I'm talking for me specifically, but like you said, having no mechanical shutter ruins it, uh, for you with relation to photography. I understand. I've actually attempted to take photos using electronic shutter on the ZV E10. If the rolling shutter was bad on the FX30 due to electronic shutter, which is not, it's okay. It's like 16 milliseconds. The rolling shutter on this guy with relation to electronic shutter is horrible. That's why mechanical shutter is the only way to go. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I get what you're saying. Now the A7 IV is an option, but for the price uh, of the glass is too expensive. Have you considered the Sony A7C? If you want full frame mechanical shutter, right? Good quality video, no really known overheating issues other than the fact that if you put it out in the sun direct light for like maybe 30 minutes in a hot day in your car, then it probably might, would overheat. But outside of that, like in almost all situations, the A7C is a great camera and you could find one used on eBay between 12 and 1400 US dollars. So, um, like I remember I saw one that I was watching and it got nabbed up like this. It was sold for $900. Um, and so, uh, that's something that you may want to consider an A7C. So, uh, if it was not enough, the rumor is, there is most likely, I mean, they have, it's going to complete their lineup. They're going to come out with a, maybe a 6,700, a 7,000, um, using the FX 30 because I mean, FX 30, if it had a photo companion, it would be perfect for you. So this is where it comes down to. Like, do you have the means of holding off? Like does upgrading right now, like if you don't upgrade right now, are you going to be losing money? That's the mindset. If you're not going to be losing money, then I would say wait six months, right? If you can wait six months, see what comes out, uh, and a hybrid style APS-C camera, like an A6700, which is essentially an FX 30, but in hybrid form, that might actually be a very good choice for you. Even if it's $1,800, I, I think it'll probably be less than that, but uh, I would think it'll probably be closer to like 1400. 
uh, mainly because of where it's going to be positioned in the marketplace with relation to like Canon, because Canon's offering is what the uh, R7 uh, in the APS-C lineup, which is their the, their highest class, and and, I, and I'm not counting the C70 because that's that's a that's a pure video camera, but the R7 and the R10, these guys are priced respectively at around what uh, eight nine hundred or ten thousand. And for the R7, R10 and the R7 is like what 14, 1500 bucks. And so it would make sense for Sony to make something that's 14 to $1,600 while the FX30 is priced at around 1800. And so uh, something to be keep in mind, but like FX30 for sure feels like a really good camera. And considering the glass that you already got something to definitely like, I would even say if it wasn't for the rolling shutter and your primary thing is video, then go with the FX30. But if you do take a significant amount of photos, or even if you do more photos and videos, then just wait, hold off. Or if you absolutely need to make a purchase today, I would say consider the A7C. I'm just thinking out loud here. And so, because uh, you want to work in social events, weddings, etc., yeah, I mean, social events and weddings, like these are indoor settings typically, and t and, and the low light, having a full frame is definitely helpful. So again, it, my mind just keeps going back to the A7C. Uh, and I thought a full frame was the way to go, but really now I don't know. Again, look, the main advantage of full frame, when in comparison to uh, an APS-C sensor, within the context of video, is essentially low light, right? you will be able to crank that ISO to 12,800 without an issue, right? That might be like your max setting, maybe a little bit of noise reduction, but probably not. You can probably get away with not, uh, no noise reduction. Um, whereas with relation to photography, I don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe you could crank it up with a higher ISO, but like really, I, like, I don't know, unless you want that spaghetti arm type of look where, you know, you're holding a wide angle lens and you look like you're being sucked into, uh, you know, infinity, but like you know, a lot of Canadian YouTubers tend to do that a lot. But outside of that, I mean, I don't know. Um, I hope this was a help uh, of, of value. I'm just kind of thinking out loud with you here, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you can wait, then, then see what, uh, be patient, see what Sony comes up with. If you have to make a purchase right now, consider the A7C. If I were in your position with the glass that you have, I don't think it's worth it to switch systems from Sony to Canon. Um, in my case, it's, it's weird because in, in my case, I have like 90% Canon glass. Half of that Canon glass is, or uh, it's not Canon, but half of the glass is vintage. So it's Canon FD or stuff that has been adapted to EF. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, the only Sony native glass that I have is the kit lens that came with the ZV-10. Um, and I have a couple of EF-M lenses, the kit lens, which is the 18 to 55 and the 22 F2. But like Sigma lenses are amazing. Sigma art lenses are like, and like the 18 to 35, but like Sigma prime lenses adapted to Sony, they just, they just work. So something to also consider for the future is that um, as you build that, cause one of the, one of the roadmaps I have for myself with relation to glass is build out my entire Sigma EF art lenses. So that includes, I have the 24, I have the 1835, I have the 31.4, I have a 24, uh, 1.4. Eventually, at some point, I'm, I'm considering I got to get the 50 1.4 and the 85 uh, 1.4. Uh, I also want to get the 70 to 200 Sport 2.8. I'm considering maybe the 50 to 100, uh, the, the zoom lens that's assisted to the 18 to 35. Those two lenses together would go really well. But the zoom lenses, when adapted to Sony, don't perform as well as the prime lenses. That's why I've got my eyes on the prime lenses. Um, one of my dream lenses is the, uh, Sigma sport, uh, 120 to 300 millimeter F 2.8 zoom lens. Uh, but that's a whole different thing. I rented the 60 to 600 millimeter Canon sport lens that was worked flawlessly with the ZV E 10 adapt via the Sigma MC 11. That's another lens I would love to own one day. Um, but again, like this is my roadmap to know that this is EF glass that would work across the board. 
uh, regardless of what system I'm on, whether it's Canon, Sony, or Panasonic, uh, especially with the new phase detect technology that Panasonic has adopted finally um, with the uh, S5 Mark II and S5 Mark II X, and hopefully with whatever upcoming cameras that Panasonic has. So that would be my suggestion. Any glass you get going forward, consider Sigma EF Art. Um, and uh, when it comes to the body, if you have to make a purchase today, perhaps a Sony A7C. If you can wait, hold six months, see what comes up with relation to the next APS-C um, hybrid camera that would be using the FX30 sensor. Um, and rent that camera, don't even buy it up front. Rent it and see, see if it's what you're looking for. In fact, I would suggest renting both if you have any rental options where you are in Peru, Peru, uh, then uh, rent both of them and try them side by side. Or if there's an event coming up, you know, yeah, rent both of them and see how it works out for you. Um, this way you have the option of 4K60. That's the one downside with the A7C. You're not gonna get 4K60, but SNQ mode is really nice. The 1080p SNQ mode on that is, uh, I found it to be great. So anyway, that's it. This kind of became like a podcast. <laughs> I hope you found value in this. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. I'll see you soon.